The Cavalcade of America. Many years ago, when Thomas Jefferson was president and everything beyond the Allegheny Mountains was a wilderness, the DuPont Company began to play its part in the establishment of chemical science in the United States. And so, in presenting the Cavalcade of America, DuPont has a feeling of kinship with the American pioneers whose faith and courage were such essential factors in the progress of our nation. As you listen to these episodes from the nation's past, you will have a feeling of reassurance in the knowledge that the same ideals of American character live today in the cities, on the farms, marching forward in the cavalcade of America. Our first story this evening takes place down south in Georgia in the year 1842. It was just about then that Stephen Foster began composing the melodies that became the folk songs of America. Our Cavalcade Orchestra will play a group of songs by Stephen Foster. Of America, there are many heroes who unselfishly played their parts 
in making our country a better place to live in, who did their work for humanity rather than for gain or glory. And nowhere is this spirit more truly found than in the great medical profession. It is March 30th in the year 1842. In the little town of Jefferson, Georgia, a 27-year-old physician, Dr. Crawford W. Long, is in his living room talking with a group of friends. No wonder they don't take you seriously making fantastic claims like that. But, Mr. Hears, I'm telling the truth. Oh, Doctor, oh, no. Laugh if you will, Mr. Rawls. The day is coming when a surgeon will be able to operate without causing the slightest pain to the patient. Mm. Dr. Long, for years, the finest minds of the whole world have looked for something to deaden pain. How a young man like you, hardly out of the university, can imagine... I it. don't imagine, Mr. Rawls. I've tried to hear how you came across this painkiller. Well, about a month ago, a young fellow came to me and asked me if I could make nitrous oxide. What's that? Laughing gas. When I was up north, I knew some students who sniffed laughing gas and said it stimulated them. Lots of students have tried it. But this chap that came to see me wanted some. I didn't have any apparatus for making it, so I told him I knew of a substitute. I offered him a sniff of ether. I poured some on his handkerchief, but he breathed in so deeply that it overpowered him. He fell down those three steps leading to my laboratory and broke his leg. What? what the... When he broke his leg, under the influence of this ether, he claimed that he didn't feel any pain. It wasn't until the effects of the ether wore away that he knew anything was wrong. Oh, that's different. A man may be insensible for a second and not be conscious of pain, but an operation takes time. I have inhaled ether and been unconscious for at least 15 minutes. Unconscious, perhaps. But how do you know if you were insensible to pain? How do you know that a sudden pain wouldn't have aroused you? Dr. Long, take part with this. Yes, yes, sir. There's Jeff who will see you, sir. Oh, we'll be going. going. No, no, don't go, Jim. Go now. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon, Mr. Venom. Doctor, I've heard a rumor that you can perform a surgical operation without hurting a man. Who told you that? Uh, your colored boy, Jasper, said something about it to my Sam. Jeff was a trifle premature in his booth. What's the trouble? I have something on my neck. Uh, Dr. Wilson says it's a tumor that ought to be removed. And as a last chance, I thought that you... Well, uh, sit down here, Mr. Venable, and we'll have a look. Uh, thank you. Hmm. Yes? Yes, I think I can give you relief. Without hurting me? Are you willing to let me take a chance? Yes, I am. Would you mind if I ask some gentlemen to watch this operation? Why, uh... I don't know. It'll be really for your own protection. They'll see that I don't try to deceive you. Oh, Mr. Thurman, Mr. Hayes, Mr. Raw. Yes? Uh, come here a moment, will you please? Well, I want you to witness what may be a great achievement or a colossal failure. Oh, don't say failure, Doctor. Oh, what's this? Good evening. Afternoon, Venable. Uh, good afternoon, Lord. Hey, what is this young optimist proposing to do now? He says he can remove this tumor from my neck. Without my feeling it. What? Oh, doctor, oh, too much, doctor, doctor, doctor. It's all right to theorize. You about... wanted proof. Yes, I but know. Right. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, yes. please. This is between Mr. Venable and myself. Now, if you just lean back, Mr. Venable. Relax. I know. You've called these gentlemen in to hold me down. No, I promise uh, But, you Doctor... That... You'll have to trust me, Mr. Venable. Yes, I will. Just put this paper cone over your mouth. So what are you going to do? Uh, doctor, what is in that bottle? Medical term is sulfuric ether. I'm going to pour it into the cone. Relax now, Mr. Denver. Take a long breath. 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 No, I There you are, Mr. Venable. It's all gone. The bandage uh, isn't too tight, is it? Uh, no, I don't feel... Oh, yes, there, there is a bandage. You say it's out? Yes. I never felt the thing. Can't believe it's gone. Oh, it is, Mr. Venable. I saw him do it. It's remarkable, Long. It's a miracle. An absolute miracle. Dr. Long, I can never thank you enough. What a blessing this is going to be for people in pain. In the 
presence of his three friends, Dr. Crawford W. Long performed the first operation with ether as an anesthetic. Though his government was slow to recognize his gift to humanity, there stands in Paris a statue of the man whose life was spent trying to make this a happier world. The discoverer of ether as an anesthetic, the Georgia practitioner, Dr. Crawford W. Long. second story in this tribute to medical science takes place at the time of the building of the Panama Canal in 1904. Our cavalcade orchestra sets the stage with Pan Americana, composed by Victor Herbert for the Pan American Exposition at Buffalo in 1901. Pan Americana makes use of Indian themes of North, Central, and South America. <laughs> cavalcade moves onward. Nowhere in this cavalcade is there a more inspiring figure than that of Dr. William C. Gorgas, who sought to benefit all of mankind and serve posterity. It is August 1904. The United States has decided to build the Panama Canal. Army engineers lead a multitude of men in a mighty venture. But the most desperate struggle is not against rivers and mountains, but against a deadly jungle pestilence. At the office of the sanitary department, Ancon Hospital in Panama, we find its chief, Dr. William C. Gorgas, busy at his desk as one of his aides comes into the room. Oh, pardon me, Dr. Gorgas. I'm sorry to be late. I met some friends of mine who just arrived in Ancon. Major Gray of the engineers and his daughter. Yes, I know Gray. Good man. They're outside if you'd care to see him. Indeed, I would. Come in, Major Gray. Delighted to see you, sir. Oh, how are you, Colonel Gorgas? Good of you to call so soon. Well, for some unaccountable reason, my daughter wanted to see this hospital. Oh, excuse me. Uh, have you met my daughter, Helen, uh, Colonel Gorgas? Welcome to Panama, Miss Gray. Thank you, Doctor. Did that you know my assistant, Captain Blake? Captain Blake? Well, it was Lieutenant when I saw him last. Uh, <laughs> don't be too excited over his promotion, my dear. Well, but... We're given high titles down here. To all the natives, perhaps. Uh, For my part, I just as soon wave the title and receive a little more help. Dr. Gorgas, might I borrow your assistant to show me around the hospital? Certainly. Uh, Is it perfectly safe? Oh, quite well screened. But isn't yellow fever very contagious? There's only one way to contract yellow fever. To a bite from the Stegomyia colopus. That's our scientific name for the special mosquito. 
Blake can be trusted not to let her visit the horrors. Yes, sir. Oh. We'll be right back. Take your time. Uh, Blake, you might inquire if there's a table for me? Yes, sir. Uh, to the right here, Helen. Yes, sir. Fine young man. Mm, so my daughter seems to think. Ought to make some girl a splendid husband. Well, just at present, there's a young man in my division, Lieutenant Chandler, who seems to have the inside track. Oh, of course, Blake isn't an engineer. What? I'm sorry, Major. I didn't mean it as it sounded. They haven't made it easy for me here. Calabria Hill and the Chagris River aren't our worst worries. When you came across on the railroad today, of course you saw the masses of rusty machinery left by the French. And those rows of crosses on Monkey Hill. The remains of the Gillespie tragedy. Yes, but the Gillespie didn't compare with our engineers. The Gillespie wasn't so bad. He built the Suez Canal. And our governor of the zone, General Davis, built the Washington Monument. But they didn't have to fight the jungle and the mosquitoes. I was warned you were a bit mad about mosquitoes. When I first went to Cuba some years ago, I too was a skeptic. Walter Reed and Carlos Finley convinced me. Finley developed this theory. Reed proved it. Please God, I can profit by it. This place is a pest hole, Gray. It was customary not so long ago for a consul to send his predecessor home in a coffin. Are you sure, old man, that you're not needlessly apprehensive? We didn't expect this job to be a picnic, you know. I know. But with help, the mosquito could be wiped out. And it must be wiped out if we're to build this canal. Come in. Oh, Helen, back so soon. Yes, God has a message for Dr. Gordon. Yes, the cable you're expecting, sir. Well, this may be what I've been waiting for. I pray so. Hmm. Bad news, sir? Read it. Read it aloud so Major Gray may hear. I cabled Washington yesterday for certain necessary supplies that were refused me here. It means the lives of thousands of our boys. Read the answer. In future, send all requests for supplies by letter. Cables cost money. Cables cost money and men die. I can't do it alone. I tell you, Gray, unless I rid this place of disease, there won't be enough trees on the isthmus to provide crosses for the cemetery. Some time later, Major Gray and his daughter are situated at Empire, a government settlement above Calabria Hill, where the big cut is being made. And Bob Blake often finds his duties leading him in that direction. Oh, um, Captain Blake, are you here personally today or officially? What makes you ask? Well, it makes a difference in my attitude. I rather like you personally. Thank you. But officially, you're a great deal of trouble. You see, the last time you were here, you men put oil in my watering cans, and when I watered my father... Water breeds mosquitoes, Ellen. You can't always see the larvae, but oil kills them. Yes, and oil kills my flowers. You know, there's a fine of $10 for anyone who leaves any water standing in the open. Oh, well, my father's an official of the canal, so that doesn't apply to me. They fined the president of Panama last week. They're even oiling the holy water response in the cathedral. We're getting better cooperation from the Panamanians than we are from our own government. Oh, Bob, you're so solemn about it. Well, you've never seen a man die of yellow jack, Ellen. Oh, that's all over. Well, look at us here in Empire, a settlement built by the army. Why, it's clean, it's sanitary. There's no yellow jack here. You might give our oil spray some credit. Well, if you're going to be disagreeable about my flowers again, I'll... Well, anyway, it was clean water. The Sagamaya mosquito breeds in clean water. What's more, she likes places where people live. Rather a social little beast, you see, and that's why we concentrate our oil in the residential areas. I see. You did come on an official visit, Captain Blake. You know, really, Tom Chandler is much more crazy. Oh. Well, I, I suppose you're seeing a lot of Tom Chandler these days. Yes, he's here now. In fact, he's going to take me to the dance at the Ellen. officers' club. Oh, Ellen. Uh, yes, Tom, here I am. Ellen, what's the phone number for medical headquarters? Well, I can't seem to raise anyone. Anything I can do, Chandler? Oh, hello, Blake. Yes. Yes, I wish you'd come in and take a look at Helen's father. His father? Well, what's the matter? Where is he? In the living room. He's well, been the... complaining all afternoon about his head. Dizzy? Tired muscles? Hot? Yes. Oh, what is it? Well, I don't know yet. Oh, Bob, what do you think? I'll tell you when I see him, dear. Well, Where is right he? in here. Well, Major. Why? He was in his chair. 
We've fallen. Oh, Take it oh, easy, Helen. He's fainted. Oh, what is Peace, it? perhaps. Scandal, will you get some more? Oh, yes, right away. Helen, get oh, Dr. Gorgas on the phone. I'd like to speak to him. Oh, yes, Bob, at once. Here's the water. Oh, thanks. Major. Major. Try now. Just a swallow. That's all. Yeah, Chandler, help me put him up on the sofa, will you? Why, what's the trouble? Well, I, I want Dr. Gorgas diagnosis. I don't want Helen to take my word for it, but he's got every symptom of yellow jack. Yellow jack? That's so loud. Hey, give me a hand here, will oh, you? But you're not serious. You don't want me to touch him. Why, yellow jack isn't contagious. So you say, but you don't know. Why, I've handled hundreds of cases and been with them night and day. Yes, but you're a doctor. Are That's you going to help me? I'm just down here. You can't ask me to touch a man with yellow fever. Father! Yellow jack. Oh, Bob, it is my fault. I wanted the garden. I left the fool standing. Oh, oh nonsense, Bob. Helen. Keep cool, oh, Father. Keep away from him, <laughs> Helen. Don't touch him. Get out of here, you. Oh, you do, It's all right, Helen. We'll take care of him. We'll pull him through. Oh, it's all my fault. Oh, Father. I can't. Weeks and weeks of devoted care and medical skill finally pulled Major Gray through the terrible illness. He was sent home to Washington, and it was over a year before he was able to return to Panama. Anxious to see what progress has been made on the canal, he and his daughter stand on Empire Hill, above the Great Calabra Hut, watching the afternoon blasting. Ellen, Major Gray! Bob! Oh, Bob Blake, you old darling! Hello, Ellen. Hello, Hello, Major. I'm sorry I couldn't get off to meet you at the boat, but oh, I got here just as soon as I could. Oh, so glad to see you. How's Colonel Gorgas? Oh, he's working hard as usual. He'd hope to meet you, too. Does uh, poor Gorgas still have his trouble? Well, I'm afraid so, Major. He's still grumbling about insufficient supplies. Well, I had hoped when the president appointed Colonel Gotel as head of the commission with Gorgas himself on the board, things would be different. Oh, they are better, but, well, Colonel Gotel is an engineer first. Huh? Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. It slipped out. Oh, I don't blame you, Bob. I was as bad as any of them. I had to be convinced myself. And it took a pretty hard lesson to do it. Oh, I don't blame Colonel Gosel, though. He's a marvel for speed and efficiency. And when he arrived, the doctor had the mosquitoes pretty well licked. When the doctor goes after anything, you know he sticks to it. Yes, I do know he does. I overheard him arguing with Colonel Gosel a few days before I came away. The colonel said, Do you know, Gorgas, that every mosquito that you kill costs the government $10? And the doctor sort of smiled and answered, but just think, if one of those $10 mosquitoes should bite you, Colonel, what a loss that would be to the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. No oh. selling tales out of school. Oh, no. Oh, Colonel Gorgon. Right, we were just asking How's about my patient? It? Oh, thanks to you, I'm quite myself again. Don't let him work too hard, my dear. Now he's back in harness. Don't worry, I won't. Colonel Gorgas, I... I'm not a sentimentalist. I don't know how to express myself exactly. But I wish the world could be told that the Panama Canal would never be finished if it hadn't been for you. Nonsense. What does it matter what the world thinks about it, as long as it's done? There's honor enough for us all in knowing we did what we were supposed to do. The Panama Canal was formally opened in 1915. Its speedy completion due largely to the perseverance of the man who fought and conquered a deadly germ. Gorgas' fame spread to other countries. He was offered a post by the British government, where he again waged a winning fight against disease. It is July 1920. St. Paul's Cathedral, two men, an American and an Englishman, are watching a solemn procession as it winds its way up Ludgate Hill. There's always something impressive about one of your military funerals. Must be someone of importance. Rather. They don't turn out a regiment, but a nobody. The riderless force following the gun carriage always gets me. Say, look. Look, the stars and stripes over the coffin. Oh, must be some pretty well-known countryman of yours. 
for our government to give him a tribute like this. I'll ask the Bobby. Oh, officer, officer. Yes, sir. Do you know whose funeral this is? General Gorgas, sir. Formerly Surgeon General of the United States Army. Oh, yes. After he retired, he helped us clean up South Africa. The king offered him a title. Of course, he refused. He did, sir. They can't stop us giving him a funeral in St. Paul's alongside Wellington and Nelson. They'll take him back home to America? They may right enough, sir. But he don't belong to you alone. He was a soldier of the world. The highest kind of duck. He belongs to us all. Doctors in the highest sense, men who through self-sacrifice and devotion to ideals dedicated their lives so that the world might know greater happiness. Through these two unselfish doctors, Crawford Long and William Gorgas, who were glorious examples of their profession, we salute the great medical fraternity, ever in the vanguard of the cavalcade of America. It is indeed true that all of us owe a debt of gratitude to the men, and women too, who, through the ages as well as through our own country's history, have devoted their lives to safeguarding the public health. In this connection, it's interesting to note that the DuPont Company recently established a permanent institution, the Haskell Laboratory at Wilmington, Delaware, for the study of occupational diseases in an effort to make life in industrial America safer and happier for every worker. As the results of this study come to light, they will be available to all people throughout the world. Modern chemistry has done much within this present generation to develop many medicinal products. Among them, a number of excellent antiseptics. Starting with salt, the chemist makes sodium perborate, widely used in diseases of the mouth. Out of chemical processes that start with sulfur, air, and water, there comes hydrogen peroxide, an antiseptic familiar to everyone. The chemistry of zinc produces a new antiseptic, zinc peroxide. In working with coal tar, the chemist makes phenol, which you may know by its more common name, carbolic acid. And from cotton, the chemist derives that most important diagnostic aid, X-ray film. DuPont is one of the leading chemical companies making these products, which are eventually used by people throughout the land to protect human life. Incidentally, those of you who are in or near New York may see with your own eyes the wonderful strides that chemical science has made in recent years by visiting the chemical show all this week at Grand Central Palace in New York. The interesting exhibits there will give you a mighty good idea of the importance of chemical research, so well expressed by the watchword of DuPont chemists, better things for better living through chemistry. appropriate on this program dedicated to medical science that we remind you of the annual sale of Christmas seals by the National Tuberculosis Association. Those stamps pay for direct care and research, not only in tuberculosis, but in other communicable diseases. This splendid work should be supported by everyone. So remember, buy Christmas seals. Next Wednesday evening at this same time, DuPont will again present the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W.A.B.C. New York.